Hello. Can you hear me? Hear me at the back? OK. Uh, I guess we can get started. Doors open if anyone else wants to join. Uh, so I'm going to get started just asking you a question. Is there anyone in the audience who uses anything other than Chrome as their primary browser? OK. 30% roughly. So you're probably familiar with pages like this one. It says, oh, no, Google Earth isn't available in your browser. Uh, click here to download Chrome. Um, and it's kind of annoying to be told that our, our tool of choice uh, isn't supported to get the content that we want to get. But in cases such as this one, you still have a you know, workaround. You can switch to that uh, browser that's not your favorite, and nothing against Chrome. That is the browser that I use personally. But uh, it's not everyone's favorite, and it's definitely not the only browser out there. But as far as this example goes, you, you have that choice, sort of. You um, switch to Chrome, and then you get the content that you're after if you were searching for uh, Amsterdam uh, on Google Earth. It's kind of the point being that you were able to make that choice. But what if you didn't have a choice? What if um, you only had one browser, um, and it wasn't Chrome, it wasn't Firefox. Uh, it was some obscure browser that 90% of developers had never heard of. Um, it was last updated last year, and it cost you 1,000 euros to, um, to update. And you had to consume all of the web through that one browser. Sounds like some dystopian kind of parallel universe that no one wants to be stuck in. But the reality is that this is what the web feels like for millions of users. <coughs> So uh, if, you're, if you're deaf, there's no other browser that you can, that you can switch to when you're trying to um, watch a conference talk, for example, and it doesn't have captions. Um, and uh, we see a lot of content providers uh, relying on YouTube or auto-generated captions like here. So this is a talk that I did last year on accessibility, but you wouldn't be able to tell that from the captions that are all wrong. Um, so um, we just, it's just one quick example of how we break the web every day. Um, and forgetting to add captions or having captions that are wrong is just one way in which we break uh, the, way for a lot of the web for a lot of people. So today I'm going to tell you about a few other ways in which we break the web every day uh, and then what to do about it. Uh, my name is Laura Carvajal. I work at the Financial Times. Um, I'm a principal engineer there. And for the first um, year or so, I worked on the FT.com team. Um, and for the last six months of that, I led the, um, the accessibility effort uh, to take our website from just having no kind of conscious effort on accessibility to you know, taking it to a level where we can kind of proudly say that it's accessible. Um, so nowadays, I work uh, in, a, in a team called Internal Products, where we build um, sort of software internally for our staff. So basically, someone pays me to build stuff for myself to use, which is a pretty sweet deal. Um, but today, I'm going to talk to you about kind of this work that we did for FT.com um, to the end of last year. Uh, and we're going to cover accessibility, what is assistive technology briefly, what types of assistive tech are out there, four, four ways in which we all probably break the web, uh, and then what to do about that, just some quick wins uh, to make some improvements there. So what is web accessibility in the first place? Um, there are many definitions that you'll find online, uh, but there's one that I really um, like very much, and it's this one. Uh, it says, web accessibility means that people with disabilities can use the web, period. Um, and I really like this one because it boils it down to making sure that we're not putting up barriers to the very thing that we're building. And we tend to be more familiar with barriers in the physical world. So just like stairs can be a physical barrier to someone kind of getting into another space, uh, there are a lot of things that we do on the web that present a very similar barrier uh, to this. So we're just going to have a look at those today. So to understand how this all happens, I'll quickly go over how disabilities can roughly be split into these four categories, physical, visual, hearing, and cognitive. So these are very broad categories. Uh, so for example, um, a physical disability may alter a person's fine motor function. So uh, that may mean that uh, you primarily use a keyboard to navigate the web, or that you use speech recognition. You just talk to your machine, and it does what you're asking it to do. Um, and these types of input typically mean that you're not using a mouse to interact uh, with the web and with you know, products that we may all have built. So that already kind of changes a little bit how we expect uh, people to use our products. Um, there are other types of assistive technologies, such as uh, screen readers, which is some software that sits on your computer and reads out web pages to you. 
um, Braille displays, which you know, does the same thing, translates a web page or you know, an application into Braille. And um, another one is uh, text-to-speech, where you can select some text on the screen and it's read out to you. Um, and there's plenty more, and um, it's kind of there's kind of some focus on the input, others on the on the output, and it can be a little bit overwhelming to kind of look at all these things and say, wait, do I have to be an expert at all these things to make my site accessible? Um, but I kind of like to flip it around a little bit and just kind of confirm that you don't need to be uh, an expert. I'm not an expert at any of those uh, of those things. Um, I, I kind of like to look at it from from the other side, looking at your own website uh, and thinking. Does my site work without a mouse, without visual cues, and without sound? Checking those three things. And you're checking three things on a thing that you're very familiar with, which is a product that you're building. Um, so making sure that we get all those three right will get us a very long way into making an accessible website. There's, there's more things, but this will get you a long way. You're, you'll be off to a great start uh, if you've covered this. So in the next few slides, I'm going to go over uh, four sites that look fine, um, then we're going to kind of uh, dive a little deeper and, and find some hidden barriers in those sites. Then we're going to look at the code and find the root cause uh, of those barriers and then uh, go over how we could fix it. So the very first one is the kayak.co.uk website. Um, it's a great looking website, in my opinion. It's kind of that typical website where you book flights. And uh, where you do that, you select where you're fr flying from, where you're flying to, uh, your departing dates, your arrival dates. And then uh, you click search and get you get some results. Kind of the typical pattern uh, for all these websites. Um, so that was me kind of clicking around. Um, but say I'm flying with uh, with Rebecca, and Rebecca is an accessibility tester at the Digital Accessibility Centre, which is a non-profit in the UK that provides accessibility services to companies. Uh, they and they audit FT.com every year. So Rebecca kindly um, has recorded a video for, for us. Uh, kind of trying to do the same thing on the same website, same thing that I did, uh, but she navigates primarily using a keyboard. She doesn't use a mouse. Uh, so we're just going to ha have a look at what the experience is like for her. Let's see if we can make this work. I'm now going to try and tap through the kayak.co.uk website. This is done by pressing the tab key, and I would then be expecting highlighting to appear on the items that I focus on. But highlighting is highlighting is only appearing on the on the fog fields, and that's because they open up when my focus is in them. The rest of the items on the page, there is no focus, meaning I'm not going to know my focus on them, meaning I won't then be able to select them. So it turns out that this experience, kind of clicking around, that seemed uh, kind of very straightforward. Uh, it's nearly impossible to replicate if you're using a keyboard. Because you, as you tap through, you don't know where you are. You don't know where you can click. Uh, so kind of digging around in their code, this is what I found. Um, and there's a lot that we could cover in just those few lines of CSS. But the one that I want to focus on uh, right now is that uh, first line at the top that says outline none. That essentially removes the focus outline of, um, of all the elements in your form. Um, so, And I've had this happen to me before. Uh, and I've done this before, before I knew uh, any of this where you have a stakeholder says, oh, that looks kind of ugly. Can you remove it, please? Uh, and then we do that, and then the focus ring is gone. Um, so while I was in DevTools, I removed all that code, or most of that, uh, and ended up with this. Um, let's see. So you see the kind of the focus ring. Uh, so you can you kind of see kind of this display that you saw before, but you see the blue focus ring as you move through the page. And that was just removing four or five lines of CSS. So now you know exactly where you are. You know exactly where you can click, and you can use the page um, just as if you were uh, navigating with a mouse. So kind of the key takeaway here is that just like the cursor is crucial to someone um, nav navigating with a mouse or with a trackpad, um, kind of using point and click, the focus ring is crucial to um, keyboard users. I don't know if you've had that feeling when you're kind of hooking up to a projector, uh, and I think I just did it now. Um, where you kind of can't find your mouse and you kind of start shaking it around. And Apple even introduced a feature where when it notices that you're doing that, it increases the size of your pointer to like 100 times uh, so you can really see it because it's, um, it's, it's clear to them uh, and to all of us probably that it's kind of uncomfortable not knowing where you are and kind of people start panicking, shake their, their pointer. 
Um, so Apple made it very easy for people to find uh, their location. So kind of imagine that feeling of, of kind of being lost on, on that interface that you're trying to use, but every day on almost every website that you try to use. So kind of takeaway here is just like you wouldn't design a site that kind of hides the pointer because it's ugly and it clashes with your design, never hide the focus ring because the focus ring is a lot of people's cursor. Uh, the good news is that we get focus out of the box without doing anything, literally. So this is, uh, I think, Chrome. This is the, um, the focus ring that you get for free. Without doing anything, you get that. Um, and uh, kind of most sites can benefit from having just that. So doing nothing gets you 100% of the way there. Um, but then there are sites that are a bit more complex that have um, lots of different background colors. Um, so I kind of like to think of these styles as your base, and that's kind of the obligatory Pokemon uh, in my slides. Uh, but there are some times we just need to start to think about how to evolve these styles if they don't fit um, with your needs. So you'd start doing that um, when you have, uh, like on the Financial Times, we have several different background colors, and one of them was blue that you see on there. And the default styles, um, you, you couldn't really see them. There, was, there wasn't enough contrast between the background and the default browser styles. So what we did was style them in a different color, uh, in a color that our designers knew that wouldn't clash with our palette of backgrounds. And that was it. So wh whatever background that um, ring showed on, uh, you would always be able to see it. So that's really great. Um, and then kind of, we once we did this, um, we had to enter some discussions with our stakeholders that would come to us and say, oh wait, what's that ugly thing? Can you remove it, please? Kind of that typical thing that we keep hearing over and over again, because you would see that if you're tabbing through, which is really helpful, but you would also see it if you're clicking, uh, which caught the attention of some stakeholders and said, no, get rid of that. So you would have to enter these discussions about how it's important for people and to please not remove it. Uh, but nowadays, you don't need to do that because we have um, Focus Visible. Um, this is kind of the, uh, it's, it's going to be part of the CSS, it's actually part of the CSS for specification uh, in draft. Uh, right now, it's a polyfill that you can use, and the polyfill is developed uh, by the same people, or part of the same people who are writing the draft, so you know you're getting um, what's going to be in the, or as close as it's going to get uh, to what's coming out in CSS4. So at some point soon, you're going to be able to use um, this um, pseudo selector in CSS with no polyfill, but for now, this is really good, and we use it at the Financial Times in FT.com. We've been using it for the better part of this year, and it's been great, because you get something like this. So if you're clicking around, you don't see any focus ring. But as soon as so you, so you click, you don't see anything. But as soon as you start tabbing through, then you see it. When you click, you don't see it. Uh, and then when you tab through, you see that very bright uh, blue ring. Uh, and that, that's been really helpful. Uh, and then stakeholders are happy. They don't see that ugly ring when they click. Uh, and then people who really need it then do see it and are able to navigate our site and get to our subscribe button and kind of get to where they need to go. And this is the team who kind of made that happen uh, on our site. Uh, and it's been, work, like I say, it's been working out really, really well. So we're kind of in a really good space there. And it's fairly straightforward to get started. And the people who develop the polyfill are very active on Twitter um, and are very supportive if you have any questions. Uh, same with the, with the team here and myself. If you want to get started with this on your site, just ping us a message. We'll be happy to help. And like I said, Focus Visible is actually in the CSS4 spec. Um, and it's the same, the same group uh, working on the polyfill and the spec. So this is, this is coming to your browser you know, sometime soon. But again, uh, only get this far if you have very specific needs around uh, color on your site. Uh, if you don't, kind of the basic browser styles uh, will, just will take you a long way. Uh, the second example I want to show you is the independent website. Um, so this is another, uh, another site that I think is kind of really beautifully designed. And uh, what I've done here is you can choose the different packages that you want to subscribe to. You can switch tabs. And then you find that in the second tab is the uh, offer that they want you to click on. You can find out more about it, and then you can click and subscribe. Again, kind of straightforward pattern for these kinds of things. We have something similar uh, at the FT. Um, but I'm going to show you uh, another video that Rebecca kindly recorded for us, where she's going to try and do the same thing I did, but using a keyboard. Let's see. I'm going to try and subscribe to a weekend subscription for the independent newspaper. 
I will do this by trying to tab for a bit and trying to tab onto the weekend tab. I'm now pressing the tab key and as you can see how it is appearing on the link to the top of the page. And I've and I've completely skipped over all of the tabs so I can even though I'm in personal I can't then tab onto personal weekend and gift to change this and I'm able to then be able to sign up for a weekend subscription because I can't tap onto it. Alright, so as you saw there, the very subscription that the independent want you to subscribe to, uh, you can't get to unless you have a mouse uh, or a trackpad. So um, let's have a look. So if you're right, if you're tapping through, you can tap through uh, all of those options. I kind of remove their 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 styles that were very gray and like a little dotted outline, um, and you can kind of see it there at the top. And then you can go back and forth, and you can never land on the weekend tab, the gift tab, or the find out more button. Um, so let's see, kind of the kind of takeaway here before we go into the code is always test your site without a mouse. Uh, it doesn't take very long, uh, and it can be like wherever you want in your delivery process, ideally you know, towards the beginning, but even if you're about to release and you kind of want to do a quick run through of your site, just put away the mouse for a bit and try and do the things, kind of do the kind of user journey using only the keyboard. Um, it's going to uncover things like this, uh, or even worse, you know, that you use it, can't get to the pay button. And we've seen plenty of examples where you have a, a subscription page with a pay button and someone's actually trying to pay you and they can't because they can't get to that button. So we kind of want to make sure that um, people can get to where they need to get on the page, especially you know, if, you, if you expect to be paid, you want to be paid. So just make sure that pay now button uh, works uh, as, ex as expected. So having a look at the code uh, the, uh, of the independent website, um, you can see that the tabs at personal weekend and gift are links, so they're uh, um, anchor tags, and they have a role of tab, if you can see, um, on that line. So that kind of tells me that there was someone uh, in that team thinking about accessibility, because th that is useful, um, giving a role to each of the tabs. Um, but you probably spotted that that anchor tag doesn't have an href. So to the browser, because there's some Angular in there, you don't need the href. This the Angular taking care of navigation. But the browser doesn't know anything about Angular. So it says, oh, there's an anchor tag here, but it doesn't take you anywhere. So it's a link that goes nowhere. So I'm not going to bother. Uh, putting um, a focus ring around it or letting you focus on it because it's you are not going to go anywhere. That's kind of what the browser interprets from that. Um, so there are a couple of things that you can do. Oh, the same thing happens to the to the find out more button. It's a it's a link with no href. We can probably do a whole talk about should that button be a link or should it be a button, but we're not going to get into that. Um, so kind of the same same problem that we had with the tabs above. Uh, one solution here is to just add an href if you can. Um, but if, like in this case, you can't because you're handling navigation in some other way, um, you can tell the browser intentionally, like this thing that you think shouldn't be focused, should be. And this is kind of how you do it. Um, let's see. So let's see if this works. Right, so you go into, right, you ins we inspect the weekend tab, which is what we're trying to fix. Um, and we go in there and we give it a tab index of zero, just that. Just zero, we don't need to use numbers there, just that tells the browser that this is uh, an element that be needs to be inserted into the tab order. And we use zero so that the browser uh, inserts it where the browser thinks uh, it should go, um, kind of in the, in the natural flow um, uh, of the elements. Um, it allows you it to insert a value there, but that's kind of, um, it's a bit dangerous because then you can end up uh, assigning val different values to things and then having the focus jump around in a way that people don't expect. So if you just do tab index of zero, uh, it gets inserted back into the tab order. Uh, and kind of the same with the find out more button. Um, kind of, and, and something I get asked often when I touch on this is, so should I just add a focus ring on everything? So developers just learned uh, that they can do this uh, they want to and they want to be helpful. Um, so they say, should I just add a focus ring everywhere? And the answer is no. Um, it seems kind of obvious if we're just talking about it, but when, once you're writing the code, um, you get into these scenarios. So where should I put this focus ring? So what I encourage people to think about is um, if you're controlling a TV or a video game um, at a distance with a remote, is where do you expect 
uh, your your focus to land if you're clicking, you know, right and left arrows. So, for example, in a, in a game such as this one, you probably expect um, the focus to land on the games, probably in the avatars at the top, so you can switch users, the the bottoms, uh, the buttons at the uh, the bottom here. Uh, but you probably wouldn't expect focus to land on kind of the Wi-Fi signal, because I mean you can see it, but there's nothing that you can action there. So the message is, if you if it's something that you would expect to click, or it's something that has an action, it needs to kind of be focusable and have that ring around it. Um, our third example is Amazon.com, which is another site that I think looks great, and it's probably a site that I spent too much time on. Um, and say I have, th this is kind of their help page, and say I have a problem with my Kindle. So I want to go on this page and get some support, and just by looking at it, you can see can probably kind of scan the page and say, okay, this is about, just by judging by the title at the top, this page is about providing help, and it has six sections, and one of them, if you look up, oh, there's device support. Um, you can kind of click on there and get the help you needed. Um, so it's just by looking at it, it's fairly straightforward to know where to go, and that's kind of typical kind of Amazon design. And uh, But I want to get into the code here a little bit. So by looking at the side, you can probably expect that big title at the top to be the H1, if you're kind of thinking in HTML, uh, and then the blue subtitles to probably be H2s, uh, kind of the structure, if you're imagining the structure of the page. Uh, and this is a kind of a simplified version of their HTML. The title at the top is indeed an H1, but then everything else below it are links, which kind of makes sense. I mean, it works, all those blue uh, headings uh, are styled with CSS, and they're actually links. So when you click on them, they go somewhere. So it's not potentially not wrong that they're links. Uh, and there's some stuff. We probably can't see it, but we don't see it on the page. There's another H1 um, below the fold, and it's followed by some H3s. So there's there's not really much of a sequence, but when you look at the page, it looks okay. So um, I guess it's, it's all right from that perspective. Uh, but now we've asked uh, Mike from the Digital Accessibility Center, uh, the same center that uh, Rebecca works in, and they test uh, websites for accessibility. Um, Mike has kindly recorded a video for us for him trying to do this same thing. And um, uh, Mike is blind, and he uses a screen reader to navigate the web. So he's going to try and do the same thing that I've just described, uh, getting to device support. So I've got a problem with... My Kindle, and I've been advised to go to device support, um, and I've found a couple of issues with trying to access device support. Uh, so if I bring up the headings on this page. Amazon.com help. Heading list dialog. Headings list view. Hello, what can we help you with? Colon one. One of three. Browse help topics. Colon one. Learn how to dot 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 colon three. So we've got two um, issues here. The first one is that we've got duplicated headings at level one, and then the headings move to a level three. So ideally, we would need only one instance of a level one, so... Hello, what can we help you with? Call it one. Hello, what can we help you with? And then subsections would ideally be given a level two markup. So if I go to the level one heading... Hello, what can we help you with? Heading level one. So this is the first heading in the page, so... And if I press down arrow, separator, black, click your orders, list of two bullet track packages, bullet editor, cancel orders, list and click returns and refunds, returns, list of two items, bullet return or exchange items, bullet print return mailing labels, and list and click device support, device support. So if that was a heading, um, that would be easier for me to identify. Screen reader users uh, will generally navigate by headings first. Um, so normally we would skim through the headings of the page uh, before we look at the links. Cool. So we, if we kind of think back to that HTML we saw before, uh, we've inadvertently made our, our page much less accessible for people like Mike to get to where they want to get to. So if he's, we've, we've kind of made him go through each of the links left to right before he could get to device support. Um, and if we had made those subtitles H2s, he could have gotten there a lot faster. So we need to think about headings as the hierarchy of our page. Um, so if we think of our page as a tree, which we can typically do if we're talking about the DOM tree and, and several uh, different other tree representations of our site, 
um, headings are kind of a tree as well. So the H1 is typically what your page is about, and that tends to be one thing, even if there are kind of two or three kind of big subsections. And then all of your subsections so should hang from there. So you should never have uh, no H1, for example. Uh, or say you have an H1, and then it should be followed by H2. So you should never have an H3 hanging off of an H1. There, there needs to be uh, an order. So people, if someone who went to your site didn't look at your site, but they looked at the hierarchy of your headings. They should be able to tell what your site is about without looking at the site. It uh, doesn't mean that everything needs to be in that tree, but there should be enough on there to be able to kind of get the general idea of, of what they're going to find uh, on your page. And like we've alluded to, there should be one H1 and only one H1. It's sometimes tempting to think, oh, but my page has two kind of unrelated things. They should be kind of two, H, two H1s, maybe. Um, but that tends to be you know, very confusing for screen reader users because they're not, they're not looking at your kind of visual representation uh, of your page typically. They're just getting it read out to them. So it's, they have like, two competing H1s and it's hard for them to tell what your page is really about. So uh, in, in most cases, your page is actually about one kind of broad thing uh, and then those two sections can be H2s. Um, so an another thing is, if something looks like a heading, uh, it introduces a section, uh, and it's directly related to the heading above it. It's probably a heading, and it should be it should have an H tag. So thinking about the Amazon site, um, those blue subtitles were clearly ways in which Amazon could help you. So they're part of that kind of help page. Um, so if it kind of if it looks like a heading, let's make it a heading. And the other is also true if. Um, if it's if it's not really a heading, don't give it an H tag. It sounds kind of obvious, but sometimes um, we tend to use uh, H style H uh, tags for styling, and we did it at the FT uh, accidentally before we started looking at accessibility. We made we had a footer and we had some links that were kind of smallish and bold, so we thought, oh, let's just make them H6. So we get the uh, the the styling out of the box. Um, and then when we had our audit and we started looking at screen readers and all that, uh, it would be very confusing for a screen reader user to hear that there were uh, all these H6s at the bottom. So they, they expected some sections uh, down there, but there was no content. So kind of never use the H tag just for styling. That's better off um, doing that with CSS. And our fourth and last example, I want to go back to videos uh, and captions. So one of my colleagues at the Financial Times has put together a video uh, that I'd like to share with you. Uh, his name is Ben Fletcher. He's a principal engineer uh, at, in FT.com, the FT.com team. And besides leading the team, he's built uh, features like our machine learning algorithms that curate thousands of news feeds. Um, and he's a software engineer, like probably a lot of you today. Uh, and he writes code a big part of his day. Um, so he's going to tell you kind of, uh, he's, it, Ben happens to be deaf blind. Um, so he's going to tell you a little bit about how video and captions are kind of uh, impact uh, his life. Hello, I'm Ben. I'm deafblind. Let's see. Here is a web page and there's a video, but it has no captions. I don't understand any of it. Let's try another video. Ah, it has captions, but the text is too small. Another video. It has captions and good sized subtitles, but it's almost transparent. Poor contrast with the video it gives me a headache trying to read. Finally, here's a video with all these things addressed, but there are mistakes in the captions. It's frustrating. You know, sometimes my work colleagues would applaud after watching a great talk and I would just copy their applause even though I couldn't follow the video. So that's kind of our last takeaway for today. Um, captions aren't optional. Um, there's, they're absolutely essential if you're distributing any kind of audiovisual content. So, uh, but it, it can be very common that uh, we're putting out content uh, and we don't have uh, a budget to pay a pro captioning service. Um, so in that case, uh, auto captions like YouTube's can be a good start. They're, they're absolutely useless out of the box, 
but um, it's very easy to make changes to them and kind of to tweak them. So YouTube uh, will generate them for you and they'll be wrong. Then you can click the edit button and it has a very nice interface to edit them. So it's, it knows exactly what time, what was said. So you can tweak the text a little bit without much work. And it's, it can be, it's remarkable how you have say an hour video you can spend five to ten minutes kind of tweaking the captions, and it makes it, the captions go from being completely nonsensical to actually reflecting what's on the video. So, um, kind of encourage you to do that. Um, so, to wrap up, I want to kind of go over the takeaways uh, that we've that we've gone through. Focus styles are the equivalent of the mouse cursor, and just like you wouldn't kind of delete the cursor uh, off your site. Uh, please uh, don't delete the, the focus style, um, especially on, on actionable things. Um, the browser defaults can take you a long way. So if you don't have time to spend kind of thinking about focus, just use the browser default styles. Just um, not using that outline zero or that outline none um, will uh, get those uh, styles on the page for you. Um, so test your site without a mouse. Uh, it's, it takes very little time and it can unearth some really big things that would kind of prevent you from things like what we saw before, not just from delivering content, but from getting paid if it's a subscription page. Um, the headings on a page represent should represent the structure of your page. So someone should be able to look at the headings and know exactly what your page is about. Uh, and lastly, captions aren't optional. So next time you publish a video, um, I encourage you to think, would I publish this video without the audio track? If the answer is no, uh, please make sure you caption it before you publish it. Thank you. Uh, I'll be around the hallway if anyone has any questions. I'm quite happy to. You're right. I'm quite happy to uh, chat if anyone uh, wants to chat further. I'll be around. Thank you. <laughs>